Job asked in the long ago, If a man dies, shall he live again? Job 14, 14. And certainly that's one of the most important questions that anyone could ever ask. If a man dies, shall he live again? And the only way we could ever know that is by looking at what God has revealed about that to us. If a man dies, will he live again? God's Word reveals that man is mortal and that all will die. It's appointed unto man to die once and after this the judgment. Hebrews 9, verse 27. We do have an appointment with death. Countless billions of people have had that appointment with death. So as Job says, if a man dies, shall he live again? What about all those people who have died? Is death the end? Or is there more to it than that? The word death, as it's used in the Bible, both in the Old and New Testament, primarily means one thing, and that is a separation. That's the meaning, the basic meaning of the word death in the Bible, a separation. It does not mean an annihilation. I repeat that. It does not mean an annihilation. It means a separation. In both the Old Testament and the New, the Bible says that physical death occurs when our eternal soul, that spirit side of us, departs from the physical body. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, the wise man Solomon talks about this. And he informs us, even in the Old Testament, about if a man dies, shall he live again. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, beginning in verse 6, Remember your Creator before the silver cord is loosed, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the well. Depictions of death. Then he says, Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, that physical part of us, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. There's a picture of death. Separation. Physical body goes back in the ground, returns to the physical elements. But the Spirit, that eternal part of us, returns to God who gave it. Now, the same thing is said in the New Testament as well. In James chapter 2, James talks about this separation of the body and the soul. In James chapter 2, read with me verse 26. James chapter 2, verse 26. James writes, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. The body without the spirit is dead. There's the separation. We're not annihilated at death. There is something that happens after death. So Job's question, if a man dies, shall he live again? The answer is yes. The Bible reveals that in both the Old and the New Testament. Death is just a separation. A separation of our physical body and our eternal spirit, our eternal soul. The word soul and spirit are, are quite often used interchangeably. Not always, but quite often they are used interchangeably to refer to that part of us that never dies. In other words, that part of us that will live somewhere forever. That part of us that is separated from our physical body at death. We go somewhere. So where is it that we go? Where does the Bible teach that we go? Well, again, there are a number of places that I wish we had time to look at all of them, and of course we don't. But one place that's certain we need to look at is that very uh, well-known account that Jesus gives us in Luke chapter 16. Please turn your Bibles. Luke chapter 16. <clears throat> and remember, this is Jesus' teaching about this very question. If a man die, shall he live again? We see from this some important parts, some important principles. Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 19, Jesus says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. That sounds like a great life. 
But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was laid at his gate desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. That sounds like a terrible existence. Here we have two extremes. In this world, on this earth, here were two men who lived at the opposite ends of the economic scale. One person that had everything in this world. Had anything he wanted to eat. He dined sumptuously. The other person had practically nothing. Ate crumbs. Dogs came and licked his sores. So the two extremes of these men. Well, what happens to them after they die? So it was, verse 22, that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. That's what happened to the beggar. That's what happened to Lazarus. That's what happened to the one who was righteous. What happened? He was carried by the angels. This is what Jesus is telling us. So we know it's true. Jesus said he was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. His physical body? No. We already saw his physical body was buried. It's in the ground. That's not what was carried to Abraham's bosom. It was that inward man, that soul, that spirit, that, that eternal part of us. That part was carried to Abraham's bosom by the angels. Well, what happened to the other one when he died? Well, the rich man also died and noticed and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. There we have those two parts of that unseen realm, as it's often called. The word Hades. The word Hades. Uh, it's most likely the word comes from a, a compound word in the original language that basically means unseen, not seeing. It's the realm of the spirits. And here we have two different men who lived two very different lives taken to two very different places. One was taken to a wonderful place called Abraham's bosom. It was a marvelous place. He was in the care, the, the comfort, the, uh, uh, the concern of the Lord. He was looked after. He was comforted. It was a wonderful place. But the rich man who had not lived a good life in this world, who had only cared about himself, he lifted up his eyes in that other part of the unseen realm called torments. And what a sad, terrible painful place that was for him. But that's where he found himself. So there were two distinct areas here that these departed spirits went to. They did not go to heaven and they did not go to hell. They did go to this unseen world, this unseen realm of departed spirits. There's a similar word in the Old Testament that is typically uh, depicted as the same place. And you see that in a lot of places. It's like Sheol in the, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word. And that's usually the same place. So it's not just a New Testament concept by any means. So people, when they leave this world, when they die, there is a separation. Their bodies, the Bible says, are buried. They go back to the ground. That, that physical part of us, you know, the muscles, the tissues, the blood, they... And those organs, that, that disintegrates and decays, goes back to the ground. But that part of us that's eternal goes to one or two places. Either to Abraham's bosom, that place of, of, of comfort and, and wonder and, and beauty, that place of paradise, as it's called in another place, we'll see, or goes to a place that is filled with torment. So that Hadean world, that unseen world that we call Hades, has those two departments, has those two compartments. Let's read on. Well, he saw, uh, he lifted up his eyes, he saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus was in his bosom. And, and we know that that's a phrase that means that they're in their care and comfort and, 
and they're being protected and, and taken care of. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Notice again, he's conscious. He's aware. He sees Lazarus. He sees Abraham. He knows they're in a better place than he is in. He's in torment. He's being tormented. And it's so awful that all he asks for is for Lazarus just to dip the tip of his finger, not even his whole finger, the tip of his finger in water to cool his tongue. That's all he asks for. That's, that's how bad he is. So he's aware, he's conscious, he's alive in that sense. Not his body. His body was buried in the ground. This is not his body. This is his spirit. This is his soul that's there. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. This was a place of torment. And besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. He says, no one can go from one to the other. Abraham says, even if I wanted Lazarus to be able to do that, Lazarus couldn't do it. He says, there's a great chasm, there's a great wall, however you want to picture it, between the two. Between those two parts of the Hadean world, you cannot go from one to the other. Of course, those who are comforted would not want to go to torments anyway. It says, you can't go. It is fixed. So when Lazarus and the rich man died, their, their destiny, if you want to call it that, was fixed. And there was no way to change it. Which, of course, tells us that the whole idea of purgatory is unscriptural. There's no way to change after one dies. It is fixed. Lazarus was there. He couldn't go over to the rich man. The rich man was over in the other department. He couldn't go to where Lazarus was. It was completely fixed. In Luke chapter 23, a few pages over, we see Jesus' words again. When he's talking to the man, the thief on the cross with him. Remember, there were two criminals he was crucified between. In verse 42, <clears throat> I'm sorry, verse 41, one of the criminals says, uh, And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Surely I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. You'll be with me in paradise. That guy wasn't going directly to heaven because Jesus wasn't going directly to heaven. He hadn't ascended to the Father yet. And I wish we had time again to look at all those, those places that talk about how Jesus did not ascend to the Father yet, but he didn't. He ascends to the Father in Acts chapter 1. And remember we see him going up into the clouds and the angels telling the apostles, the same way that you see Jesus going, he's going to come back. That's when Jesus ascends to the Father. But between Luke 23 and Acts chapter 1 or Luke 26, he doesn't. The thief is going to be in paradise. Another word, another phrase describing how wonderful Abraham's bosom is. This place of comfort for departed spirits, our souls. Another phrase for torment is found in 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, we are told in verse 4, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4 says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and the word hell there is not Gehenna, the everlasting place for hell, and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Skip down to verse 9. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. That verse, verse 9, 
is an amazingly informative verse. This was written years and years after Jesus ascended to the Father. Many, many years later. And here's Peter saying that the unjust, the unrighteous, the wicked, the evil are reserved in judgment until that day, until Christ comes back. There is a place that those departed spirits went. That place in particular in Second Peter comes from the Greek word Tartarus. It's the only place where it's used in the New Testament. So a place of torment is where the unjust, the wicked, the evil go when they die. But the righteous and the just their spirits go to a place that's called paradise, a place where they're cared for and, and, and loved and, and a place called Abraham's bosom. And what a marvelous way to describe it. And notice these spirits are, are aware and they're, they know, they're conscious. Some are comforted, some are tormented. If you're not conscious, you can't be comforted. And if you're not conscious, you can't be tormented. So you have to be aware, you have to be conscious. But this place was not permanent, the Bible says. It's not a permanent dwelling place. In Revelation chapter 20, we're told what's going to happen to that whole Hadean world. In Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse 13, this is the great throne uh, scene, judgment scene. Verse 13 says, The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one, according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. That Hadean world will hold the dead until Christ returns. There's not going to be any more physical death after that because it's judgment. There's not going to be any temporary dwelling place, no Hadean world, because now everybody's going to be sent to their eternal home, heaven or hell. When Jesus comes, a lot of things are going to happen. A lot of things are going to happen. The Bible says, and Jesus tells us, that the dead, the dead bodies, the physical bodies, those in the grave will be raised. Not their spirits. Remember, their spirits are in the Hadean world. The dead bodies, the physical bodies, will be raised from the grave. In John chapter 5, Jesus comments on this and says, beginning in verse 28, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear His voice. All who are in the graves. Not all who are in the Hadean world. All who are in the graves will hear His voice. And come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. So the dead, those in the grave will come forth. They will be raised when they hear His voice. And that's what's going to raise them from the dead. Just hearing Jesus' voice. That's how powerful His Word is. That's all it takes. And every dead, everyone buried, and you think about all the, grave, uh, the, the, the graves and, and the unmarked graves all over the world. They're all going to come forth, every last one of them at the exact same time. I remember talking with a preacher several years ago. He's about my age. And he said, I wish I could be there at two different cemeteries because I want to talk to these people as soon as they come up. I'm just thinking about some of the places I would like to be. Because every one of them is coming up. Everyone. Young, old, makes no difference. Everyone who are in the grave, Jesus said, will come forth when they hear His voice. Now, what about those people who are alive? Not, there will be some people who are alive, Jesus says, when He comes back. What's going to happen to them? Paul addresses that in 1 Corinthians 15. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 50, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. 
We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. What's going to happen to people who are alive? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, going back to John chapter 5, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. That whole chapter, of course, 1 Corinthians 15, talks about how our bodies are going to be transformed. They're going to be transformed. They have to be, he says, because they have to be transformed into something that's incorruptible, that can't decay, that can't wear out, like these do. So they're going to be changed. Then Christ, and I say then, probably this is all essentially happening at the same time, the Bible doesn't tell us. Christ will bring with him the spirits of the righteous from Abraham's bosom. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Jesus tells us this is going to happen, beginning in verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, those who have died, lest you sorrow others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus, those who have died. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain, if you're one of those, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. What's Jesus going to do? says he's going to take those righteous souls in Abraham's bosom, in paradise, the righteous, the just, bring them with him, and then those who are alive and remain or are still alive when Jesus comes and there will be people, they're going to be changed and they're all going to be together. With who? Jesus. All be taken to heaven. And all will be judged. Everyone will be judged. Jesus mentions this in Matthew chapter 25 when he says, beginning in verse 31, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate them one from another as the shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. Notice the word separate. See, there's the other death that's going to occur. The evil is going to be separated from the good. The wicked is going to be separated from the righteous. The just are going to be separated from the unjust. And that's the final separation is going to happen at that judgment day. Sheep and goats, he says. The sheep's going to go and be with the Father in heaven through eternity. The goats, as he goes on and talks about, will be cast into that everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That's what's going to happen at Judgment Day. Going to be judged. And that's the great final separation. The great final death will occur. Heaven is going to be the eternal abode of the righteous. In that same chapter, verse 34, he says, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, The sheep, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What a marvelous way to describe it. Prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Well, what's going to happen to the unrighteous? Notice verse 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, The goats, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That's Gehenna. That's the final place for the wicked. The final place for the wicked. It's called an everlasting fire. As it's often translated, hell. That's the hell. That's the Gehenna hell right there. Everlasting fire punishment and then the physical universe is going to be destroyed 
In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter makes this abundantly clear in verse 10 when he says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up be gone, perished, destroyed, annihilated. Now there's an annihilation that's going to occur. This world will be annihilated. There won't be anything left of this world. There will be no more world. There will be no more earth. There will be no more sun. There will be no more planets. There will be no more stars. There will be no more galaxies. There will be no more physical anything completely annihilated. And of course, God, the only one that has the power to do that. And that's what's going to happen. And finally, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we read this. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse 5, <clears throat> he says which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God. The judgment that God deals out, so to speak, is going to be righteous, it's going to be perfect, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer, since it's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ these shall be punished with everlasting destruction everlasting from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. That's what's going to happen. Job's question, if a man dies, shall he live again? Yes, he shall. And the place he lives again will all depend on the choices he made while he was alive, just like the rich man and just like Lazarus. Rich man made poor choices about his eternal destiny. Lazarus made the right ones. And that's what it's all about. Making the right choices. And while we're alive, we can make those choices and we can make them correctly. Number one, we can put our faith in Christ and have our sins washed away. That's the first great decision. But that's not the last decision we must make. We must decide to live faithful all the way to the end. And as Paul said... When that happens, we'll be given the crown of life. And what a marvelous crown that will be. If that's your desire this morning, I encourage you to make that decision now as we stand and sing this song. Carter.